on this Saturday night intensifying its offensive. The desperate search for survivors as Russia attacks cities in the east and south. And Ukraine's president prepares to meet with a key Western ally. Wildfire season erupts with a vengeance as U.S. states struggle to stay ahead of fast-moving out-of-control flames. Anglophone anger. Young Quebecois students uh, will pay the price for this. The growing pushback against a controversial Quebec bill. And the fierce fight to fill jobs. Good talent has their pick in terms of their employer. The shifting power dynamic in Canada's labor market. Global National, reporting tonight, Colleen Christie. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. It's a rare showing from Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky speaking in person to hundreds of journalists in an underground train station in Kyiv. The president answered questions for more than an hour as Russia continued to pound the front lines. Zelensky told reporters he isn't afraid to meet with Russian President Vladimir Putin. He says he doesn't have the right to be scared because the Ukrainian people have shown no fear. Zelensky also confirmed the U.S. Secretaries of State and Defense will be in Kyiv tomorrow in what will be the highest level visit by American officials since the war began. It comes ahead of next week's meeting with the U.N. Secretary General, who will hold separate talks with Zelensky and Putin. And as Western leaders try to restart negotiations, mixed messages from inside the battle lines are emerging. Mike Drolet has our top story tonight. New drone video has emerged from Chernihiv, a northern Ukrainian city that endured a Russian siege for weeks, but just barely. In the southern city of Mariupol, more shocking images, as a few brave residents were seen assessing what was left. Russia says the strategically important port city has fallen thanks to its Muslim Chechen fighters, who share this video of their celebration. But gunfire can still be heard coming from a steel complex, where members of the Azov Battalion are holed up. They're the group Russia accuses of being a neo-Nazi organization, an allegation they say is Russian propaganda. Inside the steel plant, women and children remain hidden in underground bunkers where food, water and hope are running out. I hope we can leave here and see the sun, says this boy, because we've been here for two months. He may have to stay a while longer because Ukrainian leaders now say the Russians have reneged on opening an evacuation corridor Saturday. Leading President Volodymyr Zelensky to say if civilians are killed by Russian forces, Ukraine will stop negotiating. Meanwhile, Russia's stated plan to take full control of southern Ukraine is in full swing. He lost the main battle in this war, the battle for Kiev. So now he's shifted. Missile strikes have hit Odessa apartment buildings, killing at least five people as the war enters its third month. Microlight, Global News, Toronto. An early and furious start to the wildfire season. At least 11 million Americans are under red flag warnings tonight to be extremely careful as fast-moving fires sweep through Arizona, New Mexico and Colorado. Evacuation orders have been issued for several counties as firefighters battle flames fueled by extreme winds. Jennifer Johnson has the latest. Out of control wildfires are being fueled by powerful and erratic winds forecasted through this weekend for Arizona, New Mexico and Colorado. The fires are spreading rapidly, leaving residents little time to leave their homes. You could hear the fire coming. It was so intense. The most destructive is the tunnel fire near Flagstaff, Arizona. Crews are struggling to stay ahead of the blaze, which is only about 3% contained. The flames are destroying virtually everything in their path. Firefighters are understaffed and outgunned by Mother Nature. The environment is not very friendly. Uh, it was blowing 70 miles an hour. Climate change has led to severe drought in the U.S. Southwest. The dry land, coupled with the high winds, are preventing firefighters from making much progress. Basically, these winds have been pushing embers over those containment lines, landing in really dry brush, creating new spot fires. Families are desperate to hold on to their homes or any belongings they can grab before fleeing. But with the fires spreading so fast, it's hard to predict what neighborhood will be next. It just is really frightening to you know think that just like that, it's gone. 
Dozens of structures have been reduced to rubble. Firefighters are trying to save what they can, including pets and farm animals. Operation Pig Rescue. Nice work. Here we go. This is an early and devastating start to the year's fire season. Already over 400,000 hectares have been lost, nearly double what was lost during the same time period last year. Colorado's governor fears this could be his state's worst fire season ever. These events are not anomalies, and that's why Colorado really needs to up our game to prepare for the year-round fire risk that we now face. Now states are grappling with the reality that the wildfire season may be year-round, as thousands of firefighters across the states battle nine different major fires. But until these winds die down, Mother Nature is winning the battles. Jennifer Johnson, Global News, Washington. An intense search and rescue effort is underway off the coast of Japan after a tour boat carrying 26 people went missing in frigid and rough waters. The Japanese Coast Guard says the boat disappeared off northern Japan after issuing a distress call saying the ship's bow had flooded and was beginning to sink. Waves in the area were reported to be up to three meters high at the time. Police have visited the sightseeing tour company which owns the boat, but no details have been provided about those on board. Here at home, the conservative leadership race hit a key benchmark this week. At least eight candidates made the deadline to file their paperwork and submit the first installment of the $300,000 entry fee they'll need to pay by the end of the month in order to stay in the race. On the West Block tomorrow, David Aiken is joined by two leading lights in Canada's conservative movement, former Saskatchewan Premier Brad Wall and former Cabinet Minister James Moore to examine the health of this race and the health of the party. David. Well, Colleen, neither Brad Wall nor uh, James Moore have endorsed any candidate for leader, but both want to see the party emerge from this contest in a stronger position to compete for votes and compete for power. And they say party members can help by picking a leader who is not going to apologize for being a conservative. There's a sense that many conservatives, especially those in the West, went with Aaron O'Toole and before him, Andrew Scheer, in the belief that a watered-down conservative would somehow translate into more seats. They did vote with the party last time. They stuck with it, I think, for the most part. Uh, but I'm, I'm not sure that's the case now. But I think that's why you're seeing Pierre Polyev get a good degree of support because of the, the energy that he's bringing to the campaign and the way that he's sort of being, being thoughtfully aggressive about being proud to be conservative again. <laughs> An Ipsos poll published last week, done exclusively for Global News, found Pierre Poilievre was clearly the favorite among those who identified as conservative voters. But whether it's Poilievre or another candidate, Wall believes the winning formula for the next leader will be a laser-like focus on the economy. The economy is going to be the number one issue. The economy that uh, individual Canadians face in their household in terms of budget, in terms of affordability questions, and just uh, Canada's overall economic health. And there is a sense among Conservatives that the next election could be theirs to lose. Now, there's still a long way to go in this race. The vote is not until September. Colleen. All right, David, thank you. And you can catch the full segment with former Saskatchewan Premier Brad Wall and former Cabinet Minister James Moore tomorrow on the West Block, right here on Global. A battle is brewing in Quebec over a proposed language law that could force college students to take three core courses in French. Anglophone groups say Bill 96 would make many students fail and potentially drive many out of the province. Dan Spector looks at the growing pushback as the legislation nears adoption. John McMahon runs Vanier College, an English CGEP with nearly 10,000 students. After high school, Quebec students go to CGEP before entering university or the workforce. Lately, McMahon's main focus is the fight against Quebec's new law bolstering the protection of the French language. Unfortunately, uh, students, young Quebecois students, uh, will pay the price for this. Bill 96 has been working its way through the legislative process for nearly a year. It's Premier Francois Legault's update to Bill 101, the law that prohibits English-only signs and bans immigrants from studying in English public schools. Now Legault wants to do more. It's important to understand that French will always be in a vulnerable position in North America. And we have to be careful. Most Quebec Anglos have no issue with preserving French culture, but many feel the bill goes too far. 
is really a hammer uh, being used to swat a fly. One recent amendment targeting English CGEP students has the entire English school network preparing for war. The provision would force English-speaking students to take three of their core courses in French. And while Anglos all learn French in high school, there is a difference between French as a second language and learning in French as the language of instruction. A significant number would either experience lower grades than they normally would if they were studying in their mother tongue, uh, or they may have difficulty even passing the courses. That could mean trouble getting into university. Cadell thinks many will just choose to leave for other provinces. If they go elsewhere, they won't come back, they won't improve their French, and they won't become integrated into Quebec society. So it's a complete loss. It's a loss, loss situation for everybody. The amendment was initially proposed by the Quebec Liberal Party, which is usually where most Anglophones park their vote provincially. After the backlash, their leader admitted it was a mistake, but many are now questioning their allegiances to the party, which was already lagging in the polls. Making things worse for the Liberals, a new party called Mouvement Quebec has just emerged. It is against Bill 96. We want to be a party that represents Montrealers here at the National Assembly. McMahon is among several prominent Anglophones working to plan a protest in May. I'm hopeful that the, the sense of fairness, the sense of justice will prevail. Dan Spector, Global News, Montreal. Coming up in the equivalent of a buyer's market for jobs, what employers are now having to do to hire. And the Alberta program that gets surgery patients on their feet faster. So you're going to add to that 26000 Did you bet a lot? Wow, $8,000. Look at that, $34,000 more for you today. Matteo Roach has won her 14th game of Jeopardy, becoming the first Canadian to win that many games in a row. The 23-year-old has now racked up more than $407,000 Canadian. She's also earned a spot in the Jeopardy record books, placing number eight on the all-time consecutive games list. Roach, who is from Nova Scotia but now lives in Toronto, will return to the show next week. Well, Roach isn't the only one on a tear right now. The job market in Canada is red hot and it's causing a power shift. There are about a million openings across the country and just about the same number of people looking for jobs. Companies are now being forced to offer more than just a paycheck to attract workers. And Gaviola has more on the battle for talent. And in this ultra-competitive labor market, employers are realizing they need to be more flexible and offer job seakers more choice. Two bad, one bad, so sorry, I will pay 100000 Stephen Dollywall works in sales. A year ago, when he was looking for a job, he applied for positions and got no response. The market was so competitive at the time, with many people looking for a job but not that many openings, it was really tough to to find the right fit. Wash your eyes here, full size. He ended up landing a job as a sales associate seven months ago at Vancouver's West Group. He was looking for a good work-life balance and found it here. We have set hours and we aren't expected to be available during outside of our work hours, which normally in the real estate industry are kind of available all the time. So in that sense, um, you know, you really get a chance to step back from work, enjoy the rest of your life. Now, with the demand for workers, he's being contacted by those employers who didn't respond to his job applications a year ago. Recently I've had some of those same positions I applied for now reach out to me um, to see if I was still interested in pursuing that opportunity. I think uh, good talent has their pick in terms of their employer and we are well aware of that. Can you give it a second to John? Hi, come on in. This shift in the power dynamic with employees is making companies look at different ways to find and keep talent. We're happy you came to West Group. Providing the option to work from home, hours that are more flexible, and other benefits like gym memberships and healthy lunches. It also means changing the traditional ways of how hiring is done. Scotiabank has set up satellite offices and removed the resume requirements for some hires. Instead of resumes, it's using a 25-minute survey developed by a recruiting company. If you look at the data that's in resumes, it's full of systemic barriers and biases that dictate access to education, access to even internships, or how fast somebody's progressed in their career. You can line up 100 people and say, okay, these people tomorrow would be eligible, they could do the job. But it won't tell you who out of those 100 people will actually perform well, be a top performer, enjoy the work. 
In what's being called the war for talent, HR and recruitment experts say innovation in hiring is critical during this transformation of the job market. Colleen? And Gaviola in Toronto, and thank you. And you can catch Anne's full story on how companies are luring top talent in this hot job market tonight on The New Reality, right here on Global. Faster recoveries ahead, the Alberta program that's setting a new world standard in care. Alberta is leading the world in a program that gets surgery patients back on their feet faster. Along with reducing hospitalization time, experts say the program could also cut costs and pain medication use for patients. As Su Ling Go reports, it's also freeing up precious bed space during the pandemic. When Linda Poissant had ovarian cancer surgery in Calgary last year, she was told recovery would be at least 10 days in hospital. Instead, she was out in five. I was eating, I was walking, my pain was well controlled, so was my nausea. I definitely said, I'm ready, I'm ready to go home. Linda was part of ERAS, the Enhanced Recovery After Surgery program. Contrary to standard protocols, she was encouraged to eat a bit before her procedure, then eat and walk shortly after. She also had minimal narcotics and a warming gown like this one before and during surgery. I was just warm, the air is blowing in through the gown and it was, and it was great. We know that patients who uh, have temperatures less than 36 degrees uh, you know, for a significant period of time during surgery are actually more prone uh, to complications. Dr. Greg Nelson says the program challenges some historical surgical practices like fasting, which have little evidence to support them. There have been skeptics, there have been some surgeons, anesthesiologists who might have been reluctant to adopt this, but, you know, the answer is really in uh, the outcomes. Among five surgery types, nearly 7,000 patients spent an average of nearly one day less in hospital and had about 16% fewer readmissions. For those that were readmitted, their stay was close to two days shorter. ERAS has saved the healthcare system more than $34 million. For every dollar that we've invested in ERAS in the province, we've actually seen $7.3 in return. The program has also freed up precious bed space. About 10 years ago, Linda had a smaller surgery and stayed in the hospital for two weeks. This was much um, larger surgery and uh, within a few hours I was up and walking on my own. So they're doing something right. Giving away the profits, the BC thrift store owner whose bottom line is kindness. Next. The Toronto Raptors have kept their playoff run alive after a much needed win over the Philadelphia 76ers. The team delivered in a do or die game four at Scotiabank Arena this afternoon, leaving the series at three games to one for the visiting Sixers. And there was some additional good news for Canada's team today. Raptors forward Scotty Barnes was named NBA Rookie of the Year before the game, making him the first Raptor to win the honour since Vince Carter did back in 1999. A thrift store in British Columbia is making a name for itself, not necessarily for what it sells, but for how it's helping the community it relies on. In just four years, the owner of Denny's Dynamite Deals has donated tens of thousands of dollars to local schools and charities. Kylie Stanton explains why. Step inside and try to take it all in. Oh my golly, there's all kinds of good things. Clocks, sporting equipment, art, clothing. Stuff for the kitchen, uh, stuff for my shop. All of it at one time, one man's trash. Yeah, thank you, my dear. Now this man's treasure. Nothing was planned, it just happened. And now we've got a place that's just turning into a great community. Dennis Bazot bought this old grocery store in Nanaimo's Harwood neighborhood back in 2018. He had retired, had time on his hands, and an idea. I do not want money to rule this store. Roughly 90% of the inventory at Denny's Dynamite Deals is donated by Nanaimo residents, while Bazot buys the rest at local garage sales. But what's perhaps even more interesting than the items he's collected is what he's managing to do with it. It's grown, 
and the money going out has grown with it. In less than four years, Bazo has simply given away roughly $180,000 in merchandise. I try to do $200 a day that goes out the door free. It's for people that really need it, and I have a good sense for that. Another 140000 has been donated to local charities and schools. Two weeks ago, we, got, we were the recipients of $14,000. $14,000. It's amazing. It's really a message of hope and, um, and community and generosity. And that's what keeps people coming back. Since word's gotten out about what Denny does in the community, uh, the community supports the store with so many great donations. Wherever he th knew there was a need, he would help. It's just wonderful. For Bazo, it's just a matter of looking at things a little differently seeing the value where others might not, and perhaps opening some hearts and minds along the way. But it isn't about the almighty dollar, and that's what makes it special. Kylie Stanton, Global News. And that is Global National for this Saturday night. I'm Colleen Christie. Tonight's Your Canada, the seaside cliffs in leading tickles Newfoundland and Labrador. We would love to see your corner of the country, so please keep sending your photos to viewers at globalnational.com. Thanks for watching. Hope you'll join us again tomorrow. Have a great night.